In the heart of Minneapolis, amidst the bustling cityscape, a legend was born. Prince Rogers Nelson, known to the world simply as Prince, emerged from these streets, forever changing the landscape of music. Today, we dive deep into the roots of his upbringing and the iconic symbol that became synonymous with his name. Stay with us as we uncover the story of a prodigious talent who captivated the world. Prince wasn't just a musician, he was a movement. In his wake, a legacy of art, individuality, and heels. Yes, heels. Born on June 7, 1958, Prince's musical journey began in a home filled with the sounds of jazz and rhythm and blues, thanks to his jazz singer mother, Maddie Shaw, and his pianist and songwriter father, John L. Nelson. But it was not just their professions that influenced him. Prince's foray into music started at a tender age, mastering the piano, guitar, and drums by the time he was just a teenager. As Prince stepped into the limelight, his identity morphed into something beyond just a musician. Purple rain, purple rain, that's all right. Come on, y'all. Purple rain, purple rain, oh, yes. Don't it feel good? Only want to see you, see you. Can I play this guitar? He became an emblem of artistic freedom, sexual expression, and unapologetic individuality. And nowhere was this more evident than in the unpronounceable symbol he adopted in 1993. This symbol, a fusion of the traditional symbols for male and female, represented more than just a stage name. So while Soterra is given credit for the love symbol, it was actually a work from her creative team. Under Prince's direction, and in conjunction with Paintbox designer Mitch Monson, the love symbol album was released in October 1992, and 10 months later, Prince changed his name officially to that symbol. And just as the word love in the symbol implies, we know that Prince had a much deeper meaning for the symbol. It wasn't just a name or an unpronounceable symbol. He used the concept of love and God interchangeably. You know, you can sit down and break bread with somebody and just discuss uh, the fact that Christ is present. He's not coming, he's present, and it's time for all of us to kind of wake up to that fact. It was a declaration of Prince's fluidity, an embodiment of his fight against the constraints of labels and genres. It stood for being undefinable, for being Prince through his music, his style, and this powerful symbol the fact that he seemed to spend his whole life trying to accumulate a, a security blanket. What if everybody around me split? I'd be left with only me. Prince first performed the title track from Purple Rain at the First Avenue nightclub, still standing in Minneapolis. He sings about trying to forgive his parents and made this song the theme tune to his first feature film. He wasn't... A man to talk a lot, but my gosh, his music, he said everything in it. He told you everything that he was thinking and doing in his music. Prince invited us all to embrace our individuality, to love without boundaries, and to live with an open heart. It must be weird, I mean, because we listen to you. Do you listen to you? <laughs> Yeah, but I, I tend to listen to new things. I make music all the time. When I want uh, new music, I make it. From the outset, Prince's attire was a crucial element of his persona, a visual extension of his music that was as eclectic and avant-garde as the sounds he produced. Among the most striking aspects of his wardrobe were his high heels, a daring choice in an era where gender norms were strictly demarcated. Prince's heels were not merely a fashion statement, they were an act of rebellion, a deliberate blurring of gender lines in a society that demanded conformity. So Prince obviously was a relentless performer, and this is a great example of that because these shoes here 
show the wear. <laughs> and you'll notice that the fabric has actually been burned off the shoe in some cases, and that's because there would be friction burn that would occur between those shoes and the stage. Doing the splits doing the and splits, doing the on spinning toes. around. Yeah. I mean, that's who Prince was. And so when they were on tour, knowing that he had to do it again the next night, they would sometimes just repair them a little bit, color them in with a Sharpie. Seriously. To, uh, you know, mask, mask the damage. They, they don't look so comfortable. Of course, I'm not one mm. to wear heels like that. Sure. But tell me about the comfort. Were they comfortable for him? So in speaking with his designers, they yes, they would say they were comfortable because they're custom-made shoes. Yeah. They're built specifically specifically for Prince's foot. And then not only were there heeled shoes, but he also had boots. And here we are, Love some those. furry boots here. Perfect, perfect. Talk about these shoes, because oh my goodness, I remember those so well. If you know anything about Prince, it's likely you know a little bit something about these shoes, because these were the shoes that Prince wore when he was filming the music video for Raspberry Beret. And he did have a matching suit, of course, in conjunction with his <laughs> shoes, as he often did. Nearly every outfit Prince ever owned was custom made for him. So that outfit was sky blue with these hand-painted white clouds as well. Yeah, and really quick before we wrap it up here on this section, uh, the Batman shoes. The He's Batman. got a number of those. So another important era for Prince, he recorded uh, and wrote the soundtrack for the 1989 film Batman which actually gave him one of his number one hits, Bat Dance. But you can tell these shoes were a part of that era because of that Batman logo on the toe. By strutting onto the stage in his signature heels, Prince challenged the conventional notions of masculinity, inviting men to embrace their femininity and express themselves freely. His confidence in heels, paired with his undeniable talent, commanded attention and respect, making the statement that true power lies in being unapologetically oneself. The impact of Prince's choice to wear high heels resonated far beyond the stages and the glamour shots. It sparked conversations about gender fluidity and self-expression that were far ahead of their time. Prince spent a good portion of his time just waiting for the rest of us to catch up. He was known for his outrageous and gender-bending fashion choices, and at just five foot three, favored a four-inch heel. But McGuire says they were much more than a fashion statement. These shoes were used as quite literally a tool for his own artistic expression. And so when he's on stage, he's dancing, spinning, going into the splits, coming back up again, you can see how the toes have been worn away. Was that when he was scraping? Exactly right. You can kind of get a little hint of his body, and I loved it, showing his body. Designer Stasia Lang spent three years creating fashions for Prince. You had to make sure that the whole outfit was put together. That's right. Prince showed the world that clothing and footwear are not just about style. They're about identity, about challenging societal norms, and about the courage to stand out. Prince's heels became a beacon for those who felt confined by traditional gender roles offering a glittering example of what it means to walk one's own path. In reflecting on Prince's journey with high heels, we are reminded of the power of fashion as a form of personal and political expression. I remember hearing Anderson Cooper talk about it with me. Anderson Cooper were backstage at a Prince show, and I stole a handful of guitar picks. Mm -hmm. And Anderson was looking, I was like, you want one? And then he mentioned it on one of these morning shows. But the, what he doesn't know is, the guitar picks meant a lot to me. Whenever we get too tied down to anything mm -hmm. uh, on earth, be it a name, a body, a, um, a lifestyle, that's the road to ruin. But there was more to Prince than just his music. He was also known for his controversial views on relationships and sexuality. Prince's 1984 film, Purple Rain, was a landmark moment in his career. It was a semi-autobiographical story that dealt with themes of love, loss, and redemption. While the movie was a critical and commercial success, it also sparked controversy due to its explicit content and sexual themes. He always had this kind of metrosexual vibe to him, even back in high school. Absolutely. Even before I knew what this metrosexual, you know, I, I you know, come to know that word, but before I knew what that shit was, yeah, he was, he was on that tip. Right, and I guess he took a lot of his style from like hairdressers and like feminine, you know, okay. like ways and so forth, but he really knew how to kind of he, also keep it macho at the same time. He, he got a kick out of, uh, yeah, the, the gay hair stylists and stuff and the way they talked, the stuff they laughed at. It. Okay, but you said that he was always straight as a gate. As far as I know, <laughs> you know, as far as I know, you know, he was into the girls.
Prince's music also reflected his views on sexuality. Songs like Darling Nikki and Erotic City were groundbreaking in their explicit lyrics and provocative subject matter. Prince's live shows were legendary for their energy, excitement, and risque nature. He often performed in provocative costumes and had dancers who were equally uninhibited. The operating assumption in the early 1980s was that Prince was gay. In a 1983 interview with Musician Magazine, Prince was asked, Do you think people think that you're gay? Prince replies, Well, there's something about me, I know, that makes people think that. It must stem from the fact that I spent a lot of time around women. Maybe they see things I don't. Men are really closed and cold together, I think. They don't like to cry, and I think that's wrong because that's not true. Prince, that is, was not comfortable with the expectations of American masculinity. It didn't allow for vulnerability, intimacy, or open expression. People thought he was gay not because of any evidence about his sex life, but because he sometimes wore makeup, heels, and flamboyant clothes. Because he didn't conduct himself as a real man. For his fans, of course, his difference and willingness to transgress boundaries was a large part of his appeal. Mainstream America, however, was not quite as understanding. When Prince and his band, The Revolution, opened for the Rolling Stones in 1981 at the Coliseum in Los Angeles, the artist's difference was suddenly the target of a burst of intolerant rage. Prince hit the stage in his signature black bikini briefs and trench coat, expecting a similar enthusiastic reaction to what he was getting in the smaller venues on their tour. It was quickly apparent, however, that the predominantly white, rock-oriented crowd wasn't feeling it. The music wasn't the main problem, although the artist's new wave-inflected funk may not have made sense to the older crowd. It was Prince's androgynous appearance. The crowd began booing and shouting racist and homophobic epithets. Prince tried to adapt, injecting more rock into the performance. But before long, trash, food, and bottles were being hurled onto the stage. The artist remembers looking out at the audience and zeroing in on one man near the front, with hatred all over his face. After submitting to the abuse for several songs, Prince had had enough. Mick Jagger and others tried to persuade the artist to give it another try, and he reluctantly came back for one more show, but again was met with intense hostility. This time he flew back to Minneapolis and refused to open for the Stones again. Prince was wounded by the experience but he also refused to be intimidated or reformed. A brilliant performer and marketer, he recognized that the crowd at the Coliseum represented the past. He and his multiracial, multigender band, The Revolution, represented the future. Despite the controversy and criticism, Prince remained steadfast in his beliefs and continued to push boundaries. In the quiet spaces between the applause and the encore cheers, Prince found himself in solitude, a stark contrast to the flamboyant figure adored by millions. I felt that he was super cautious, like he had trust issues. I felt that's why I was called a lot of the time because I just think he wanted to have people around him that he felt safe with. At the heart of Prince is someone who was consumed by music and needed everyone around him to understand that. Prince's genius was never in question, yet the seeds of his self-destruction were sown long before he became a star. I don't think he ever felt true love. I don't think he ever felt true acceptance. Prince expressed his deepest feelings in his music. Please, Lord, spare me. And he wove his childhood trauma into iconic songs and timeless hits like When Doves Cry. I'm cold, Dad. Life is very tough when you're a 12-year-old, short, teased African-American with no money who can't come home. His damaged past compelled Prince to look for home and family in all the wrong places. His childhood, tainted by sex, set him on a collision course, personally and professionally. It was in these moments of isolation 
that some of his most introspective work was born. His music spoke of love found and lost, of the eternal search for connection in a world that often felt cold and indifferent. Despite the entourage, the fame, the adulation, Prince navigated his world often in solitude, seeking solace in the one relationship that remained constant, the one with his music. As a rock star, Prince would always be surrounded by women. He was linked with his backing singers and co-stars throughout his career. And yet intimacy would be problematic all through his life. I saw him as straight because of all these gals that are around him, but um, I did often think that maybe he wasn't really interested in sex, which seems so bizarre. Sexual ambiguity, never feeling normal, problems with intimacy. Prince toyed with his public for years, constantly exposing different aspects of his sexual being. He dressed up. Sometimes he presented himself as hypersexual, sometimes as buttoned up. When I saw what he looked like, I couldn't believe it, because I thought, oh, he's cute, but he's got, like, suspenders on and some sort of thing, crutch thing going on, covering his crutch. I was like, whoa. And then he had on, like, heels, like, over-the-knee boots. and so, I mean, he was really out there. So I've got to ask, why the high heels? People say I always wear high heels because I'm short. I wear high heels because women like them. Prince's debut album was released in 1978, and it's called For You. If you're a real Prince historian, you might even know that the then 20-year-old boy wonder and musical genius turned down several major labels before signing with Warner Brothers, since they were the only ones to allow him to produce his own work. Due to his desire for his first album to be absolutely perfect, he allegedly ended up spending close to $170,000 recording the first album alone. This meant that his follow-up album, 1979's Prince, self-titled, was recorded on a very small budget. And his third album, 1980's Dirty Mind, was recorded with almost no budget at all. Ironically enough, each album would be more successful than the last, despite the dwindling budgets. And the style and punk-funk sound of Dirty Mind actually benefited from the low recording quality. Warner Brothers decided that a good marketing method for promoting Prince's debut single Soft and Wet would be to give away an item in a competition that was both soft and wet. They ran promotional contests in the US for the single where they gave away waterbeds. Controversy, 1981 and 1999, 1982. With Controversy and 1999, Prince explored themes of politics, religion, and sexuality, further pushing the boundaries of mainstream music. The latter's title track became an anthem for the ages, immortalizing Prince as the architect of the soundtrack to the end of the century. The arrival of Purple Rain marked a zenith in Prince's career. More than an album, it was a cultural phenomenon that won him an Oscar, solidifying his place in the pantheon of music legends. Yet, beneath its success were layers of controversy, from its explicit content to the intense scrutiny of Prince's personal life. Around the World in a Day, 1985, and Parade, 1986. Continuing to defy expectations, Around the World in a Day and Parade, saw Prince blending psychedelic pop with funk, jazz, and rock. While commercial success was undeniable, critics were divided, highlighting Prince's fearless experimentation with form and genre. The 90s saw Prince embracing new trends while remaining unmistakably unique. Diamonds and Pearls featured his new backing band, the new power generation, and produced hits that remain timeless. Musicology. 2004. With Musicology, Prince made a triumphant return to the forefront of music. The album and its accompanying tour not only re-established his relevance but also served as a critique of the music industry's shift towards digital consumption. Prince's journey through sound was one of constant evolution, defiance, and unparalleled creativity. Each album carved out new spaces for his genius to flourish, challenging listeners and the industry alike. Artificial age is a testament to Prince's ability to evolve with the times while staying true to his roots. 
The album opens with the track Artificial Cage, a blend of funk and EDM that immediately sets the tone for this genre-defying journey. As we move through the album, tracks like Clouds and The Gold Standard remind us of Prince's unparalleled talent, infusing complex musicality with profound lyrical themes. One of the standout moments of Artificial Age is the ballad Breakdown, where Prince's vulnerability and depth as a songwriter shine through. This song, among others, underscores the introspective and reflective nature of the album, inviting listeners to ponder their existence and the fabric of reality. If you ask any artist, the music is a success upon creation. Mm -hmm. um, when you give it to somebody like a Rolling Stone or a Vibe and they start um, critiquing it, then y your perception changes. But that's looking through somebody else's eyes. So again, we um, gauge success based upon what we feel in our hearts, you know. Uh, we've shut our minds off now. Minds should be used for what they were made for, filing cabinets. We think with our hearts, you know. At, at the heart of the matter, though, is the music. You know, I, I am a musician. Um, I don't sample, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's not Memorex. I go on stage and my microphone is on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? What? And the image award goes to Halle Berry. As if this couldn't be more amazing to win an image award, but to be, have it be handed to you by Prince. I've only loved him my whole life, so thank you, Prince, for honoring me tonight. And thank you um, so much to the NAAC. Hypothetically, you would win in a fist fight. You were Michael Jackson. <laughs> You're both roughly, you know, the same size. You know, you have the both, both have the high pitched sound. You know, what do your right right hook like? Oh my goodness, he's a plant, y'all. <laughs> but I plant him. Yeah, you know, keep it light. Keep it light. How about this? Michael's not a fighter, he's a lover. <laughs> oh, can I, can I just say something? I've never really uh, spoke publicly about Michael. We should all just kind of, like, chill because it's, you know, he may know something none of us really know. And just, like, let's wait and see. Let's wait it out. You know, let's just wait it out. You never know, right? You just never know. Ultimately, we all got to come back home. So let's just make a home for everybody. I had a discussion with my guitar player recently about using swear words. And I know that I respect my wife to the point where I don't use swear words around her. But yet and still, when I get around these two, <laughs> we, we start slipping, see? So. <laughs> That's right. Hey, Prince, could, could, you, could you just say, Sherry, I love you? Thank you. Sherry, I love you. <laughs> Breakfast yet, so. Can I have your gloves? Can I no, have your gloves? No, he didn't. He, he's. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand, Prince. You. I have what? wanted to make love Shut to you for my whole life. I'm sorry. Now he's leaving. You're scared of If I can stop swearing, everybody can stop swearing. <laughs> I like that. If you have a mishap in the middle of the night, if you kick the edge of your bed, what, what do you yell? Mm, artichoke. <laughs> <laughs> you're a very mysterious man. You don't do a lot of interviews. You're very sweet, but you're very much to yourself. Okay. And ch shy? Mm, I wouldn't say Okay. Shy. So, I mean, when you go on stage, you're a different person. So, but off stage, you're very quiet and very mysterious. What is that all about? I'm just that way around you. <laughs> well, <laughs> what good it was so. But it's interesting because on stage, it's all out there, and privately, you're a very modest man. Mm -hmm. Or quiet. Uh, I have my quiet moments. This is one of them. <laughs> you, you had how many birthdays? Me? What do you think? Well, I know that you had one birthday. Yeah. 
When you were was born yeah. on a certain day. Absolutely. You had no more birthdays after that. So I don't celebrate birthdays, so that stops me from counting days, which stops me from counting time, which allows me to still look the same as I did 10 years ago, <laughs> just like that lady did. Do you still have the same firm belief in reincarnation? <laughs> Since you don't count days and don't count birthdays? Do you still have the firm belief in not wearing ties? Yeah. Um, I saw you coming in, yeah. because normally I'm wearing a tie. Really? Yeah. All right. But you look so great that I thought, well, this is the most modern thing I'm having. You, you, you look sharp. You yeah, look sharp. yeah I, was, I was watching a show with uh, Esperanza Spalding, who's mm -hmm. a friend of mine. Face uh, uh, And... Uh, she, we were both sitting there quiet, we were watching. We looked at each other and then she says, are you rearranging the music right now in your head? <laughs> and then she said, so am I. So it's really hard to watch other musicians because you tend to, you know, it's like a painting you want to make straight or whatever. Do you have a cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> no. See. I'm always shocked when I hear from you. Yeah. Uh, but how do you survive in this world without a cell phone? Everybody I know has one. Oh. Personal relationships often mirrored the themes in his music. Prince's romances were high profile and contributed to his mystique. So if you came of age in the 80s, like me, you might say that Prince's music was like the soundtrack to your life. But there's no one for whom that's more true than Maite Garcia, the belly dancer turned author who traveled the world by Prince's side for years. She was his wife, his muse, his best friend. He had also instructed his wife to say nothing about their son. He even gave Oprah a tour of a mayor's playroom. It's been rumored that the couple's baby boy was born with health problems, and the reports have fans concerned. What? Take a break. <laughs> In Maite's 2017 memoir, she said that they had a hard time processing their son's death. A birth certificate listing a male child with no first name and the last name as Garcia was filed with the county. It said a boy was born to Maite Garcia Nelson on October 16th, weighing 7 pounds and 12 ounces, and that the mother refused information pertaining to the father's identity, according to the birth certificate. Local officials were also investigating whether the death certificate was filed under a false name, which is a misdemeanor in Minnesota. Prince was intensely private and at that time a devout Seventh-day Adventist. Maite was pregnant, there was something wrong. She claims Prince declined medical intervention. The faith that he had just, it just made me believe that everything was gonna be okay. It wasn't. Their baby Amir died of a rare genetic disorder, Pfeiffer syndrome, at just one week old. She did become pregnant again, but suffered a miscarriage. I think that's what drove us apart. Three years later, Prince married Manuela Testolini. I think he thought because we lost our two children, two babies, that I wasn't the one. Prince's love life was as complex and multifaceted as the artist himself. Moreover, Prince's relationship with Vanity, the lead singer of the girl group Vanity Six, which he formed, highlighted his role in shaping the careers of the women he was involved with, often blending romantic and professional dynamics. These relationships were not just tabloid fodder. They were integral to his creative process, inspiring some of his greatest songs and performances. Beyond his personal relationships, Prince's broader views on sexuality and gender were revolutionary. 
Vanity appeared in commercials for Pearl Drops toothpaste before completing a modeling stint in Japan. Matthews had a small role in the horror movie Terror Train, which was filmed in Montreal in 1979, and she then went to Toronto to film the lead role in the B-movie Tanya's Island. She was credited as Dee Dee Winters for both films. Matthews passed away in Fremont, California Hospital on February 15, 2016 from kidney failure at only the young age of 57. Suzanne Munzi and Brenda Bennett were already members, and Prince decided Denise needed a stage name. Prince initially wanted to name her Vagina, but she refused, so they settled on Vanity as he considered her to be the female form of himself. The group was renamed Vanity Six. At the peak of her career, she was Prince Muse and inspired his Purple Rain film. She also inspired him to make purple his favorite color, right? Because lavender was her favorite color. So from modeling to singing and acting, Vanity seemed to have have lived a fulfilling life. Before her untimely death, she had given up life in the entertainment industry and chose to be an evangelist. As we journey through the life of Prince, a story of unparalleled talent and artistic innovation, we also confront a chapter that left the world in mourning. The stunning loss of pop superstar Prince, one of music's most unique and dynamic performers who gave us such hits as Purple Rain and Little Red Corvette. The world stood still as news broke of his untimely death due to an accidental overdose of fentanyl, a powerful opioid. Prince's passing was not just a loss of a musical genius, but a wake-up call about the opioid crisis gripping the nation. In the wake of his departure, another drama unfolded, one that underscored the complexities of legacy and the importance of preparation. Prince, who had exerted meticulous control over his music and image throughout his career, left behind no will, plunging his estate into uncertainty. Without a will, Prince's vast estate, estimated to be worth hundreds of millions, was subject to state laws of intestacy. This oversight led to a prolonged legal battle among potential heirs and raised questions about the future of his unreleased music and assets. The drama surrounding Prince's estate serves as a poignant reminder of the fragility of life and the complexities of death, even for someone as larger than life as Prince. It underscores the importance of planning and the profound impact our decisions have on those we leave behind. Yet, even as we grapple with the circumstances of his passing and the aftermath, Prince's legacy remains untouched, immortalized through his music, his influence, and his symbol. It's a legacy that transcends the material, reaching deep into the heart of what it means to truly live and create. Prince's story is not defined by its end, but illuminated by the brilliance of his life, a visionary who challenged us to see beyond the ordinary, to embrace our uniqueness, and to live passionately. As we remember him, let's not dwell on the silence of his absence, but celebrate the symphony of his existence. And so, as we close this chapter on Prince's life, we're reminded of the power of art to heal, to unite, and to inspire. Prince may have left the stage, but his music, his message, and his spirit dance on, echoing through the halls of history and into the hearts of millions around the world. Thank you for joining us in this intimate exploration of Prince's life and legacy. Let us carry forward his message of love, creativity, and resilience. For more stories that inspire and challenge, subscribe to our channel and journey with us through the lives of those who have shaped our world. Until next time, keep the music playing and keep the legacy alive.